Hello, my friends, and welcome to a new format of video that I have not done before, but uh, this is not something unusual. And what I'm talking about here is a simple slide presentation that I thought I would share in this format because as of late, maybe due to the pandemic, people being at home, having a little bit more time on their hands, and having a physical practice that now is very much led by themselves, whether they are coaches or fitness uh, enthusiasts, they are being faced with new questions, questions in regards to progression, questions in regards to techniques and developing techniques, and a lot of them are searching for some answers, and uh, some of those answers have been found, or at least uh, begun to be explored in my book, specifically in part one of my book. And in part one of my book, if you haven't read it, it's all about my language and framework for teaching, progressing, and making observations on physical movement, physical practice. And I thought I would do this video as a way of trying to, one, share the framework that I have already presented in many different formats before, but also helping you get some questions answered and maybe find some clarity and connect some dots. And the first thing I want to start with is with the question that you see on the screen right now, which is what is freestyle? And before I go into the formal definition of what freestyle is, I want to make note of how freestyle is spelled free plus style. Now that plus that you see in between the word free and style is a purely aesthetic element. This is a design element. It's called Swiss design. This is something that I got to learn more about when I was working with the two designers that helped us with the book, Nick and Smitty. And I really liked it. And the reason I liked it was because it allowed us to look at freestyle from two different perspectives. One, from the side of searching, exploring for freedom. Freedom being the highest level of independence and responsibility that one can achieve. And in doing that through movement, through one's physical practice. On the other end, of that plus sign, we see the word style. Style being the way, your way of doing things, the individualized approach to a physical practice. And those two elements, the freedom of practice and doing it your way is the essence that freestyle really embodies. Now, in the book, of course, we had to formalize what freestyle was, and that's why we defined it as an approach to fitness in which one practices multiple disciplines with the intention to develop a foundation of skill, which we're going to talk about, aimed to help you, whoever's practicing, meet a specific need. This is really important. The idea that one's practice is designed, developed, intended to meet a need. So one of the things that we want to do with freestyle is one, we want to identify what is skill, what are different disciplines that we may be interested or uh, willing to explore, and how can we utilize what's within those practices to help us get a need met, a specific need met. And this is going to be your anchor for uh, going down the rabbit hole of exploration. And that's what freestyle really is from a fitness perspective. Now, freestyle is much more than this definition. Freestyle is also a language, which I'm going to talk about. Freestyle is a philosophy, a way of doing things. And freestyle is also, and most important to me, a lifestyle. So these elements, lifestyle, philosophy, language, are the three pillars that encompass everything that is the lens of freestyle and the act of exploring fitness 
as I defined earlier, with the intention of getting a need met. In order to understand freestyle at a deeper level, we need to go into the following, which is the expression of one's physical practice, which happens through motion, through movement, as you can see here. And at the highest level, what I present is a framework that I call position, movement, purpose. And it's in this framework where we can start to identify observe movement, we can start to distill the elements of the movement that we need to distill for our own purposes and then progress them. Now, the starting ground for all of this happens through the lens of position. Position being the answer to these two questions. Where are you and what do you look like? Now, I want you to imagine your body in space floating and it not interacting with its environment, just floating in space. And when you ask yourself this first question, where are you? I want you to be able to see yourself in space. And when you follow up with the question, what do you look like, to see what shape you're in. This is a purely geometrical exercise. And if one can do that, then one can start to see movement through these different positions that we go through. Specifically, as you can see on the screen right now, three master positions. What I'm trying to say here is that every movement, although has an infinite number of positions that it goes through, there are three master positions, and those master positions are the start position, the transition position, and the finish position. If we look at this little illustration of Mr. Sticks, he is standing in front of a stool. That shape right there, the standing position, is his start position. The second illustration we see is Mr. Six sitting on that stool. He is in the transition position. And then the final illustration that we see is Six standing back up. Now, the beauty of this is that this is taking a movement as simple as sitting onto a stool and then standing back up and simplifying it by seeing the different positions that it goes through specifically the master positions, such as the start, the transition, and the finish. Now, the key position out of these three, start, transition, and finish, is the transition position. It's the transition position because it allows us to see four different aspects, four different aspects of movement. One, the place where we find and we solve problems. The second aspect is where we start to differentiate one movement from another. We can see the differences between two elements. The third aspect is seeing relationships between movements, similarities. And the fourth aspect here is for developing progressions. And you'll see how all of these aspects tie into one another as we go through this. So let's move on. From the transition position, the first thing we can identify is the problems. And one of the questions that I get all the time is, Carl, I can do 100 pull-ups, 100 dips, but I can't get my muscle up. I can't get through the transition. How do I do this? This is a classic question that I get. And where is the problem? Well, the problem, if one can do 100 pull-ups and 100 dips, is clearly not in one's numbers strength in the start, not in one's numbers strength in the finish, but rather in the mechanics that exists in the transition, going from one's pull-up to one's dip when performing a muscle-up. This is the highest level of importance that exists by seeing that master position in the middle, the transition position. Now, if we continue to move through this framework, what we'll see is that the second thing that the transition position allows us to see is the difference between one movement and another. Now remember, 
when I was talking about position a second ago, I told you to imagine a body and its shape in space just floating. What this means is that we are thinking about movement without thinking about the task or function or purpose that it serves, just the geometrical shapes. And if we look at the illustration right here where I identify the difference between a squat and a deadlift, Mr. Sticks in the transition position right there in the center, you see him right there in the middle, he is in a deadlift and a squat position. We're seeing the overlap between what a squat position would be and a deadlift position would be. And although there is movement in the hips, movement in the knees, movement in the ankles for both movement patterns, the deadlift and the squat, there's a difference. The deadlift has the hips a little bit higher, the knees aren't as bent as in the squat, and the ankles are a little bit more neutral. Whereas in the squat, the squat has a fully flexed hip, a fully flexed knee, and the ankle going into what's called dorsiflexion. But that is just a geeked out way of talking about biomechanics. All I want you to see is the difference between two movement patterns right there, specifically from the transition position. Why is this important? Well, because it allows us to see mechanical differences between one movement pattern and another, but at the same time, start to identify what the transition position is. It all kind of folds into one another. On top of that, what I want you to realize is that this is very important for developing progressions, and we're going to get into it in a little bit. And one of those examples for seeing a progression within the differences that exist between one movement and another is, for example, in the walking versus running illustration that we see here, where you see Mr. Sticks walking, that's the blue figure or teal figure, and then Mr. Sticks running. Without looking at this image too much, I want you to think about what's the difference between walking and running. They are similar patterns, but the main difference is that when walking, one always has one foot in contact with the ground. When running, there is a moment where both feet leave the ground. That means that the transition position within a walking pattern always has one foot on the ground. The transition position within running has both feet off the ground. There are subtle yet very important mechanical differences that allow us to see not only the similarities, but the differences. And why are similarities and differences important? Well, as you can see right here, in this illustration, we see Mr. Sticks performing a squat, performing a pistol, and then doing some weightlifting. If we look at the red shape, the geometrical shape that we see in the squat, in the pistol, and in weightlifting in this illustration, which is showcasing for some movements like weightlifting the start position, and for other movements like the squat and the pistol, the transition position, we now have mechanical similarities. And mechanical similarities allow us to develop progressions or accessory work. What do I mean? Well, if we take a squat and we think about a squat as lowering our center mass as low as we can towards the ground and using both our legs and doing this, we can progress that squat with two legs into a single leg squat, a pistol, where the mechanics are very similar, but requires one to progress into it from something a little bit more basic, something a little bit more accessible. On top of that, what we see is that squatting with two legs definitely relates to weightlifting. But how does a pistol, for example, relate to weightlifting if you never pick up a barbell with one leg? Well, maybe it can be part of one's accessory work. If you've ever performed a pistol, you know that the squatting mechanics are there, but it requires a higher level of balance. Balance is important in weightlifting. It requires a higher level of strength. Strength is important 
in weightlifting and it requires a higher level of mobility and flexibility, which is also relevant and important in weightlifting. These similarities at a mechanical level allow us to create nice progressions. So that's why having an understanding of where the transition position is and what it looks like is important. Now, progressions. Notice I've said the word progression already a couple of times. And when it comes to the transition positions, the transition positions can help us anchor our system or way for progressing a movement. In this example, we have Mr. Sticks performing a push-up, a one-arm push-up, and then a ring row. Let's look at the push-up versus the ring row. The push-up, as you can see in this illustration, at a geometrical level, it's showcasing what the shoulder is doing as it's coming down, how it's traveling forward, the elbow is going into flexion, and the wrist is in extension. Now, that shoulder and elbow position, if you look at it in relationship to what's happening in the ring row, it's exactly the same. The difference is that the push-up is a pushing exercise and the ring row is a pulling exercise, but the geometry of it is exactly the same. Notice how the ring row is a mirror image of the push-up. Here's a, a quick little aside. A lot of times I get people asking me the question, Carl, I can do 100 pull-ups, 100 dips, but I can't perform the transition for a muscle-up. What's going on? And when we look at their pushing mechanics versus their pulling mechanics, the geometry is different. That means that they're using different strategies, and thus they can't go from a pulling movement into a pushing movement or from a pushing movement into a pulling movement. That's where things start to break down. It's like you have built a house of cards. So why the transition position? Because the mechanics allows us to create strong progressions. Now, the figure that you have right in the middle here with Mr. Six performing a one-arm push-up is also important. This is important the same way the pistol is important in relationship to a two-legged squat. It's a more advanced expression of a mechanical pattern that is going to challenge balance, strength, mobility, and thus coordination and many other attributes of fitness. So having the eye trained to see transition positions is going to allow us to develop stronger progressions. It's going to allow us to see how these progressions manifest and are designed according to the transition position itself. It's going to allow us to create accessory work around a specific practice. This is where we saw the difference between deadlifting and squatting. Just because one is trying to get better at squatting, it doesn't mean they should only squat. They should accessorize maybe with some deadlifting or kettlebell swings or anything that has to do with hip hinging. And then it ultimately allows us to solve problems, seeing and solving problems. Now, if we take that framework and we just put it on the back burner for a little bit and we go back up to the high level framework of position, movement, and purpose, now we can dig into the aspect that exists between changing shape from one position to another. And that is what we call movement. Now, in movement, what we are always asking ourselves is, what is movement? Well, it's exactly what I just said. It's the change in position. And what do we know? Well, we know that the change in position that happens in space, that is the motion that we observe. That's what we experience. And when one looks at movement, specifically from the perspective of freestyle, it's important that we simplify things and we think about movement as going from one master position to the next. And realizing that between one master position and the next, there's an infinite number of changes that we go through. And if there is an infinite number of 
changes, that means that there is an infinite number of possibilities, an infinite number of ways. And that's why it's important to see movement as a language. And what is it that language does? Well, language gives us a code. Language gives us information. And that's why I present right here the uh, thought of uh, imagining or thinking of a squat. So if you take a minute right now and you think of a squat, what does that look like in your head? What are you picturing right now? If you start to picture that squat, you may start to realize that you are talking about a kind of squat, a specific movement pattern. That's why I asked the question, what kind of squat are you thinking about? And once you realize that you're thinking about a type, a kind of squat, you start to realize that movement is a code. When I said squat, you had a picture. You had information in your head. You received the transcription from that code. And that's why it's important to look at movement as a code and to realize that a code is simply a system of words, letters, figures. For us, this is a figure, it's a geometrical shape or a symbol that can be substituted for other words, other letters, and realize that it's all in relationship to one's purpose, of intelligence. Now, what does this mean? Purposes of intelligence in this case is the realization that through code, one can develop a greater understanding. Through movement as a code, one can start to develop a greater level of intelligence, movement intelligence, physical intelligence. And this is important. Because our bodies, once again, are like a brain. They function in a very similar way. And once we understand how the body functions, we can upgrade our intelligence. And it happens specifically through one's purpose. And that's why the position, movement, purpose framework is so important and valuable. Now let's get into purpose. Purpose being the act of making something specific. What do I mean by this? Well, you can see here that if we use the example of the squat, the act of squatting, the mechanics of squatting is general. Meaning that when I asked you to think about a squat, you thought of a certain type or kind of squat directly associated to a purpose. If you're a weightlifter, you thought maybe of a front squat or a high bar back squat. If you're a power lifter, maybe you thought about the position of the bar slightly different, the position of your feet slightly different. So purpose is what takes a code such as squatting, the act of squatting, and makes it specific. That's why I say here that once we look at a squat through the lens of purpose, things become specific. And as you can see in the illustration, a powerlifting squat versus an Olympic weightlifting squat versus a poop in the woods squat is all squatting, but the expression of the squat is different. The powerlifter has a wider stance, the bar is in a certain position in relationship to its shoulders and back, the weightlifter may be performing a front squat or a back squat, the stance looks different than the power lifter. And then Mr. Sticks pooping in the woods, as you can see, he's just trying to relieve himself. So the mechanics there look different. Everything that is seen in regards to movement through the lens of purpose changes the expression. This is extremely powerful to realize because it's what allows us to see the infinite number of styles for movement out there and how they translate into us as individuals getting our needs met. Now, this is where I get a little cheesy and I create a little smiley face as you can see here in this diagram where I say that purpose makes movement specific. I've already said this before. In other words, purpose defines movement. So, 
In other words, if you can learn to see movement for its purpose, you will succeed not only in seeing further down the line of your development of movement, of your physical practice, but also in adding value to your sport, to your community, the people that you practice with, and to yourself. This is fundamental, and this is why the position movement purpose framework is so powerful and why movement is in the middle because movement with purpose defines a specific practice and that specific practice also implies that there is a way, a specific way or what one would consider a right way. And when one starts to imagine themselves as righteous in their ways, there is a fine line that one walks with their ego. And this is something that I will talk about in future videos, but it's extremely important in being able to progress is to realize that we can't succumb to what we think we are. We have to be practical and realistic, but also very open. And that's why this question around, is there a right way for moving is important because there is, there is a right way. There is a perfect way. And the perfect way is always the way that is required for you to get a need met or for it to, and when I say it, I'm referring to movement, for movement to serve a function. Thus enter functional movement. We've all heard about this. And if you are in the CrossFit space or in the fitness space, you've talked about this. But for some reason, we get a little confused when we have to define it. If I ask myself, what is functional movement, and I Google it, for example, I will get a few definitions. One coming from Wikipedia that states that functional movements are movements based on real-world situational biomechanics. I don't even know what that means, <laughs> but, but it, makes, it makes sense if I, if I start to uh, really dive into it. And that usually involve multi-planar, multi-joint movements, which place demand on the body's core musculature and innervation. That is very technical, very complicated, very off-putting if you ask me. On the other hand, you have CrossFit's definition of functional movement, which I believe is a little bit more accessible, which states that functional movement is the ability to move large loads, long distances, quickly. Now, those are two uh, definitions that you can find out there. One, the Wikipedia one, is very geeked out, very complicated. I don't think it's something that most people could read and understand. I think people would read the CrossFit definition and feel that they're able to relate a little bit more. But anyone else who has a different movement practice than CrossFit they would beg to differ here and they would have a completely different opinion. And that's why freestyle doesn't define functional movements, but rather simply looks for the characteristics that exist within functional movement, which for me are that they are safe, meaning I can do them in a way that doesn't harm me. They are useful, meaning they serve a purpose and ultimately long lasting. They will last a lifetime. And these characteristics, what they do when they are present in our physical practice is they produce a standard, a movement standard. And what is a movement standard? Well, for a lot of people, a movement standard, unfortunately, is a prescription. It's trying to Rx a workout. In CrossFit, this is very prevalent. For example, if they prescribe a workout of the day, such as Fran, which is 21 15, 9, thruster and pull-ups at 95 pounds for the men, 65 for the women, one is constantly trying to chase that prescription so they can belong to a club. But that prescription is just a universal prescription. And what we're looking for, as I've already addressed before, is our own way, our own prescription, our individualized prescription. And that's where the movement standard 
really needs to be found. So what is a movement standard? Well, a movement standard is technically a recommendation by an authority. And thus, that means, that implies that there is an authority. And who do you think is the authority? Well, if you think about this, most likely you will start to think about experts, you'll start thinking about coaches, but in reality, the main authority is you. You are the one that holds the responsibility. And this is the beauty of being aware of how our bodies function because we're the ones that are operating them. We're the ones driving the vehicle. So this is something that I find very empowering and very enlightening when I'm thinking about my movement practice and how I'm communicating with other people who have extensive experience or no experience at all. And this really brings us to a place where we become more observational. We start to look at movement as we're practicing it and we're seeing other people do it as a witness. This is the most fundamental level of awareness. And in observation, what we look at when we're specifically looking at movement is we're looking at two aspects. We're looking at a global aspect and at a local aspect. The global aspect is what refers to the shapes that the whole body can adopt. And the local aspect refers to the shapes that the major joints adopt. So remember, if we go back to thinking about position and position simply being a geometrical shape in space, at a local level, we're looking at joints. At a global level, we're looking at shapes. Now, when we think about global and local, what we're really referring to is looking at the body through a micro lens and a macro lens. We're looking at those two aspects. And when we're talking about the global side of things, what we're really putting focus on here is on what is known as the midline, which is the imaginary line that crosses your body from head to toes. It represents your spine and the extension of it. And of course, there are many reasons for addressing movement from this perspective. But first and foremost, in my opinion, what we're trying to look for is movement control. Now, what does the midline have to do with movement control? Well, because the midline is an extension and expression of our spine, our spine contains our central nervous system, the command center from the brain all the way down to our spine. And from there, we send a signal out into every single muscle in our body according to how we want to move. And when one has control of their midline or their spine, one has greater movement control, or as they say in the industry, motor control. And even though our spine is a very complex system composed of 24 vertebrae and different curves, it is very useful to think of this as a single unit or as the midline because it simplifies the expression of movement, the understanding of movement. It conceptualizes things. And if you want to get an idea of what I'm looking at here, I'm looking at the midline as the extension of the spine. If you look at the illustration here with sticks on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see that the spine has a dotted line that goes straight through it and is shared on the left side of that illustration going from the top of the head of Mr. Sticks all the way down to its feet. And now, when we're thinking about the midline, here it's important to have in mind two key properties. One, the orientation in space, and two, the shape of the midline. The orientation in space of the midline is important because as we change orientation in space, the way that gravity affects and puts force on our spine changes. And this change 
in how gravity is acting on our spine is going to make us act different. We're going to have to implement different strategies to be able to counter it and maintain midline stability and thus having motor control or movement control. And to make this super simple, the way that we think about our orientation in space is through four different positions a standing position or an upright position because right now for example i'm sitting here talking to you but my spine is vertical and my head is above my hips i am upright standing the other way to think about our orientation in space is inverted it's the opposite of that that would be me doing a handstand or performing a backflip the moment i'm completely inverted my hips are over my head i'm upside down then we have the supine or supinated position, which is facing up. This is when you're lying on your back at the end of a yoga class, savasana. And then we have a pronated or prone position, which is facing down position, which is less common in just resting. But think about yourself doing a push-up. When you're doing a plank or a push-up, you are in a prone position. Each one of these orientations in space affects the spine different, affects the midline. It causes us to use a different strategy to maintain the midline stability. And the reason we want to be aware of this is because when we have a strategy to maintain midline stability, we are maximizing our foundation and our ability to have movement control. Now, let's go into the shapes. The shapes that your midline creates as you move from one position to the next is very simple. And the way that I like to think about this is as a coordinate system composed by three planes, which if you've studied biomechanics, you are very familiar with these planes. They are the sagittal plane. That's the plane that divides us left to right. The frontal plane, that's the plane that divides our front and back. And then you have the transverse plane, which is the plane that divides our upper body and our lower body. And check this out. As we think about shapes in space from a sagittal plane, we're thinking about two different positions. A position that expresses flexion, that's bending forward, or a position that expresses extension, that's bending backwards. And you can see this in the illustration with Mr. Sticks. He is bending forward. You can see the dotted line going into flexion. And then you can see him bending backwards. That is the dotted line going into extension. And then on the left-hand side of that illustration, you can see how the sagittal plane divides the body in left and right side. And if we continue going through the different planes, we see the frontal plane, you can see the same thing here. There's a lateral flexion and extension. And these lateral positions are just important to have in mind because our bodies can do them. And there are certain movement practices such as CrossFit that don't really emphasize these movements laterally, but many sports do. So it's extremely important that we keep this in mind. And one of the examples that I set for the lateral flexion shape would be performing a cartwheel, specifically the beginning and the end. And now going into the final shape, which we see in the transverse plane, which would be the rotation. We see a rotation of the upper body going in one direction and the lower body going in the opposite direction. This is a twist. And not to add too much confusion to this, but one of the most important aspects of understanding these shapes is that when, for example, one is throwing a ball, there's a combination of all of these shapes that I just talked about, flexion, extension, lateral flexion, extension, and rotation, all happening at once. Furthermore, when one is performing something like a one-arm push-up or a pistol, anything that is unilateral, meaning off-axis, something that is off the midline in terms of application of force or carrying load, one is forced 
to learn how to resist rotation or resist going into one of these shapes, a lateral flexion and extension, a forward flexion or extension, or a rotation. Now, if that was too much information, just let that kind of go over your head for now, but it's important when thinking about movement. And in terms of global shapes, if there's one thing to remember, just remember the different planes of motion, sagittal, frontal, transverse, and the different positions you can adopt from a global perspective, meaning your whole body within those shapes, which are flexion and extension for the sagittal plane, it's lateral flexion and extension for the frontal plane, and it's rotation to your right and left in the transverse plane. At this level, at a global level, it's important for me to talk to you about the concept of skill. I have to ask everyone at my seminars what they think skill is, and most people get confused. They don't really know what to answer. And even when they Google it, they are confused as to what they're reading. So that's why I define skill as our ability to move, more specifically as our ability to apply strength. Now, strength is something I'm going to define once we get into the local lens of looking at movement, but for now, I just want you to think about skill as your ability to apply strength, whatever that means to you. And here, it's important for us to differentiate skill and technique. And the reason is because skill can often get confused with technique. An example of this confusion happens when in our strength and conditioning practice, we program in a skill day. And what people usually think about when they're talking about a skill day or a skill program is in learning a new movement. And when they're learning that new movement, what they're really doing is they're practicing a technique. So the question is, are you programming a skill day or a technique day? Or are you programming both? And the answer is you're programming both. And this is how to look at it. We can look at it by uh, watching this little illustration here, this diagram, where we see that each node that exists within this grid or pyramid, as you can see, is a technique. The area between the lines that connect those nodes, that's your skill. And the reason we're doing this is with the intention of learning or developing skill transfer. Now, why is this interesting? Well, if you have a physical movement practice, such as CrossFit, for example, which is intended to develop general preparedness, you have a practice that is constantly varied, meaning you're always doing different things. So if we look at the technique node at the very bottom, here we see this technique right over here at the bottom left, and we see the node that's right next to it on the right-hand side, and then we see the other ones that go all the way down the base of this pyramid, we can think about this base as general movement patterns. What am I talking about here? Well, let's consider the act of snatching, okay? Picking up a weight from the ground and bringing it up overhead in one smooth motion. Your first node right here may be a specific technique, such as a barbell snatch. The way that you would snatch a barbell in pure weightlifting, as seen in the Olympics, with those standards. The next node could potentially be a barbell snatch that you would see more in CrossFit, where you're cycling one rep after another. The technique is very similar, but different. The specificity of barbell cycling in CrossFit is different than the movement pattern seen in pure Olympic weightlifting. Now, we can go even further. The node that is next to the barbell cycling scene in CrossFit could be the act of snatching a dumbbell. 
The next one could be snatching a kettlebell. The next one could be snatching a sandbag. The next next one could be snatching a baby. I mean, you can snatch anything off of the ground. It doesn't matter. It's the same movement pattern. That similarity of the movement pattern is what we call skill. The technique is the specific and unique expression of it. Now, when one has a strong foundation of movement, as you can see at the base of this pyramid, one can start to build upon this one. And that way you build a very high and stable pyramid where we can imagine the top of this pyramid being your highest level of expression and everything else around it being the potential of your movement practice. And that's where you can see on the right-hand side, I talk about realized potential. That's the stuff that you've already learned that you've come pretty close to mastering. Then you have the unrealized potential. That's where you're going. That's where you're trying to transfer into, transcend into. And then if you ever wanted to switch gears, switch your practice, go in a different direction, you can see that your movement ability, your skill, your techniques can be expansive. And that's where you see the grid extend beyond the pyramid. Here's another way of looking at it where you can see that from one technique to another, that's the transferability, those are the lines, and what you're building amongst the pillars of your technique is the skill. Skill is the um, ability to move through space, and you probably know some people who are really good at this, and if you talk to them and you know anything about their physical performance history, Those who are really good at sport or pick up skills really quickly, they have an extensive number of techniques developed that are in their back pocket. For example, if you get someone coming into the gym for the first time and asking you what a muscle up is, you show them and they just knock it out. Those people usually have an extensive physical practice background. They may have done gymnastics. Maybe from gymnastics, they went into track and field. They became decathletes. They went into weightlifting. They loved to run, enjoyed dancing on the weekends. Maybe they were break dancers. They got into martial arts. They did jujitsu. They have an extensive background. And those with the extensive background also have great abilities to transfer from one technique to another. They can use what they learn in one technique and apply it to the next. And that is the foundation of skill, ability to move. And this happens all at a global level. And it happens because they are looking and experiencing the following, this act of shifting, connecting, and flowing. This is a very high level expression of how we um, are moving through space. And an example of this I'm going to share in a second is in walking. But the reason I bring this up is because movement as seen at a biomechanical level is really complicated. But when we can shift into a more simple and conceptual way of looking at it, now we can start to apply the laws of physics in a way that serves us without having to have this extensive background in biomechanics or physics for that matter. And one of the ways of doing this is by simply looking at the body from a global perspective, from head to toes as one shape, realizing that that body has a mass also means that it has a center of mass and that once that body is taken from space and placed on the planet Earth, then that center of mass has weight and that weight is always in relationship to the surface and base support that it's on. And when we change or shift our center of mass in relationship to our base support, we express motion. And here's an example of this where I showcase Mr. Styx walking. So if we look at this illustration of Mr. Styx, we see that the first movement that he does is he shifts his center mass in relationship to his base support. He's basically tilting, leaning forward. And with that tilt, he begins to fall. As he begins to fall, then he 
shifts gears into a change of connection. What is a change of connection? That's simply changing the points of contact with the ground, with the surface that Mr. Sticks is moving on. And that's where you see the step happening. And then when one has taken a step, or in this case, Mr. Sticks took the step, then he repeats that motion over and over again in a fluid fashion. And that's what turns into walking. Now, if you can see that shift, connect, and flow exists in every single movement, including an air squat or a handstand push-up, you can start to develop high levels of understanding for movement and the language. And you will become aware of how your body is making decisions and thus you can change how you're making decisions for your body. In other words, you can start to become more effective and efficient at driving your body as a vehicle. Now, let's shift gears, uh, no pun intended here, into the different lens that is the local lens, the way of looking at the body from a joint perspective. And this is where we're looking at our hips, our knees, our ankles, our shoulders, our elbows, our wrists. And although we have 360 joints in the human body, focusing on the prime movers, the hips and the shoulders, in relationship to the secondary movers, which for the upper body are the elbows and the wrists, and for the lower body are the knees and the elbows, we can simplify things. And in simplifying things, we can do a better job at describing the motion or the movement itself. And to be able to really take advantage of the local point of view, it's important that we see these two properties, that at a local level, we're looking at differentiating between primary and secondary movers and also the second important property is the positions of the joints in space or relative to our midline. Now if we look at the primary versus the secondary joints as I already said the primary ones are the hips and the shoulders and the secondary ones for the upper body are the elbows and wrists and for the uh, lower body the knees and the ankles and in this little illustration that you can see of Mr. Sticks, it is highlighted there. One difference that it's important to note here is that the hip, which is a ball in a socket, that's a more stable, more powerful joint. And then the shoulder, which is like a golf ball on a tee, that although it is a very powerful joint, is less stable and more dedicated to developing fine or finer movement. Now, if we look at the different positions of the joints in space, here it's important that we realize that there's internal rotation at the hips and the shoulders, external rotations at the hips and the shoulders. Now, this is a very geeked out thing to think about, but if you want to simplify it, just think about internal being moving forward and towards the midline and external being moving outward and away from the midline. Then we have flexion and extension. Flexion is usually what we see uh, when, when our arms are moving up or our legs are moving forward and in front of us. Extension is when our legs are going back or our arms are going down and behind us. And then we finally have adduction and abduction. Adduction being adding or coming close to the midline and abduction away from the midline. As you can see the difference between adduction and abduction according to Styx, he is ending up in adduction with his arms close to his ears and his legs close together, whereas when Mr. Styx is abducting, going away from the midline, he's going from overhead with his arms out to the side and for the legs going from standing to swinging the leg out to the side. All we want to know is that the different projections of our extremities are going to help us define what and how we are moving. Now, at a local level, as I addressed before when I was talking about skill, we need to introduce the concept of strength. So the question is, what is strength? Well, strength is our capacity to move. And this is really important to understand because a lot of times, whatever practice we're in, we're trying to measure our performance through numbers. And in this quote that you can see right here, 
I believe it's important for us to focus on being movement strong rather than number strong. And what this really means is to understand that our capacity to move is simply our ability to get into certain positions or perform certain movement patterns. For example, at my seminars, I like to ask the question, how strong do you need to be to perform a squat? How strong do you need to be to squat 225 pounds? How strong do you need to be to run a marathon? How strong do you need to be to perform a pistol? And most likely there is no number, but there is a sense of how strong you need to be. And it usually is an individual expression of that. And that's where one arrives at a conclusion or tends to arrive at a conclusion, which is I just have to be strong enough. And this is what leads us to talking about developing strength or capacity to move through this lens that I'm showing you right here, which is the simple, complex, simple lens. And the reason I present this is because the way that I believe that we can progress from a more basic pattern to a more advanced pattern is by becoming aware of the start, transition, finish positions that exist within the development of a pattern and noticing that maybe at earlier stages, things are more simple, more angular, and then as they become more advanced or higher level patterns, they become more complex or circular even. And having this ability to see progression from this standpoint gives us a great introduction into varying our movement ability in relationship to where we are going. In other words, what I'm talking about here is seeing progression from a geometrical perspective and keeping in mind the demand that the body requires to be able to do that. What are the physiological adaptations required to be able to move in this way? And that's why I share an example here, which is a visual of Mr. Six once again, going from a simple movement pattern into something that's a little bit more complex and then ending up in a very simple shape again. So in this illustration, I showcase how Mr. Sticks goes from an arm circle into a push-up, into a dip, and then into an iron cross. And this is intended to showcase a couple things. First and foremost, from a purely geometrical standpoint, going from an arm circle to a push-up, what we're seeing is that there is an added level of complexity. If I am thinking about myself just swinging my arms from my hands being out in front of me to swinging below my hips and behind me, I'm thinking about my shoulder being in flexion and going into extension. That's all I'm doing, a very simple motion. If to that swing, I added an elbow bend, as my arms drop, I bend my elbows, you will notice that your elbows, as they start to reach behind you, as your shoulder starts to go into extension, and your hands are in front of you still, you are in a push-up shape. I am still swinging my shoulder, but that elbow bend is sending me into a push-up position. That explains how one starts at a very simple level with something as basic as an arm swing and makes it more complex by adding more moving joints. Now, what we're also seeing here is that this arm swing that Mr. Six is doing progressed into the push-up is also in relationship to the demand that is put on the movement pattern itself. This is in terms of the function. This is important to note because when we're developing progressions, we need to learn how to see the similarities. And remember, the similarities come from the transition position. Now, if we take this a little bit further and we see the push-up progress into a dip, we are now exaggerating that shoulder going into extension, but the mechanics are still similar. It's just the angular application of force through that movement pattern is a little bit different. If we took that dip and now instead of having Mr. Sticks on a set of bars, we put him on a set of rings, all of a sudden that dip would be the same, but there 
is a higher requirement, a higher demand on maintaining stability, or in other words, movement control, motor control. And then from there, what could we do? We could think about moving away from the midline with our hands. We could go wider with our hands in that dip. We could do a wide grip dip on the rings. And if you think about going as wide as you can, you will start to see that your elbows, when you're at the bottom of that wide grip dip, are at the same height as your shoulders. It's as if you could create a projection from your shoulder through your elbow all the way out to the sides into a partial iron cross the shape that we're seeing at the very end, which has the highest level of demand, but still expresses a very simple geometrical shape. Now, this is hard to understand and complicated to explain, but when one can see the change of geometry without having to focus on the function, one can see progress. If one can also understand that when we layer in the function of a geometrical shape or a movement, one can now start develop specific movement patterns, patterns that are going to help us get our needs met or achieve the things that we want to achieve. And then on top of that, realize that there is a demand put on the body due to the functional expression or the task completion that when noted, allows us to program our training in a way that stresses our physiology in just the right way to get us as close as we can to our goal and there as safely and fast as possible. So that is the simple complex uh, lens that I think is important to address. And if it's too much right now, no worries. This is something to come back to, to think about, to ponder on. Now comes the exciting part. When we have the local perspective and we add the global perspective to what's happening locally, we will achieve a style, a way of moving. Local movement plus global movement equals style. And why is this cool? Well, because if you look at this little diagram here, you can see that if we take a movement at a local level, such as a vertical pull, which we could call a pull-up, okay? A pulling move. And we see what the body is doing from a global perspective, from head to toe. And we, in this case, note it as a neutral shape, meaning no change during the pull. We achieve a style of pulling, vertical pulling, which we could call a strict pull-up. Now, if we have that same vertical pull, but we add a change in global shape where we're going from extension to flexion, we will achieve what's called a kipping pull-up. Now, we can go even further. What if we added to the vertical pull a kick where now our hips and our knees are participating and at a global level, we still have a kip? What would we achieve? We would achieve a CrossFit level one type pull-up. What if we took the vertical pull and we made it a little bit more circular? We turned it more into an oval shape. All of a sudden, we would have a butterfly pull up. And what are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing that each style is a technique. And that each one of those techniques, technique one, two, three, and four, are also a progression that develops skill. They're the foundation of skill. We can enter the skill progression through any of these techniques, but it's fundamental as we saw earlier that we have a strong base of skill. And being able to see all styles, all techniques as skill, that is the essence of freestyle. And with freestyle, being able to create progression, entering a state of constant adaptation. And that's where it brings us to this high level picture of what freestyle really is, which is, as you can see here at the bottom, it is all those styles, all those techniques, A, B, C, and D, that develop a foundation of skill. Each one of those skills is a movement standard. That's the individualized prescription, which is directly related to a purpose and intention, which is expressed through movement. Ideally, a movement that is serving a purpose or a task 
meaning a function, and that can be studied through the position standpoint, the master positions, where we see the start, the transition, the finish. And then when studying it further from a local perspective, where we're developing strength capacity to move, we have the ability to combine local movements with the global movements, as we see here, and giving us new expressions, new styles, new evolutions, new progressions and thus having the opportunity to develop an infinite game, an infinite practice, an infinite way. And this is the essence of what freestyle is all about, which going back to where we started, it's a path to get you closer to freedom, autonomy, extreme responsibility, and doing it in a way that meets your needs, your style, your preferences, and allows you to feel fulfilled while doing that. And that is the ultimate goal, I believe, in having a physical practice or any practice for that matter. And what makes freestyle more than a methodology, what it does is it makes us a lifestyle and a lifestyle that can be shared, that can be evolved, and that can be constantly expressed at every single level, not just in sport, but also in life. So that, my friends, that is the answer to what freestyle is. That's part one of my book. That's the language, and this is the framework. So I hope that you got something out of this. If you have questions, message me. If you enjoyed the video, leave me a comment, and I'll be following up very soon with more information and answering more specific questions around some of the topics that I touched today. So for now, thank you for being here. I appreciate you very much, and I look forward to the next one. Peace.